All right, thank you, Chair. Um, as a reminder, um, this work session was requested last week and this is in response to our um, Sheriff's Office has submitted a supplemental budget uh, regarding body cameras. The purpose for today is to provide our key stakeholders an opportunity to share any financial and or operational impacts regarding the implementation of body cameras. And then furthermore, to provide the council the opportunity to ask questions and or request any additional information or data that would be pertinent as the council considers this during this budget process. So with that said, I would like to start going through our key stakeholders and provide them the opportunity to address the council and provide that feedback. And we'll start with Sheriff Atkins in the Sheriff's Office as well as his team. Good morning, County Manager, Chair, Council, and everybody else that's listening. We appreciate this opportunity to come forward and continue to discuss further um, the implementation of body-worn cameras in the Sheriff's Office. I just want you to know that I am 100% behind this. And what I'm going to do now is turn this over to Chief Horch and Chief Schultz to talk about the impacts uh, that you probably are already aware of, but we'll highlight them and then be sure to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. I saw that Kathleen set out a little agenda and it showed us about 10 minutes. So I'm going to really try to compress this and, and, and hopefully we have some good questions here. This is the just a reminder, it's the second or third time we've kind of brought this to the council before. This is not a brand new discussion about body cams, and we are in favor of this, uh, along with the, the Deputy Sheriff's Guild. We've had a lot of conversations, so everybody in the law enforcement of Clark County Sheriff's Office is in favor of a body cam uh, program. Last year, we started getting more in the weeds, and uh, it's now Chief Sample. He got promoted a, a few weeks ago. Uh, started, met with several companies, and we, we did some test runs with them for about two months. That's correct, and we got some good valuable feedback of costs and what it actually meant. We worked out some temporary policies, so we have done some of that legwork, and uh, we are ready ready to go over the next step. We're kind of waiting for the council's approval if we can get wherever the funding, how it's going to be funded. Uh, we're kind of waiting for that next step. So one thing I do want to say about body cam systems, and if you haven't done much research on them and you haven't done read much about them, they don't do everything people think they do. They, they are a valuable tool is what they are. Uh, they're a valuable tool for several for several reasons. It gives it uh, a different picture of what occurred, uh, audio and visual. It helps the prosecutor's office. It helps litigation on false claims on different things. And it also shows the uh, officer's conduct. So we've seen several incidents over the last few years where there were body cams present and there's still controversy over what happened. So I think everybody understands that it's not an end all but it does help and we are in favor of it. Um, and each body cam system that we've seen or tested, there are pros and cons to each. So I'm not gonna get in the weeds of which system we have landed on yet. We, have, we like some systems better than others, but we're still gonna do some final testing. But again, we're at that stage where we don't wanna do, continue doing this work if, we're not, if, we, if it's not gonna go forward. It takes a lot of uh, manpower hours to get in there. So. Um, we have a tentative group, a work group set, ready to go for policy. Uh, again, uh, community groups and different individuals around the community, we have them ready to go and they, they want to participate in the, in the making of this policy. So that's ready to go. Um, a big question that came up, I think Kathleen asked it or somebody else asked it, does it really have an effect to change officer's behavior? And the sheriff and I, we've talked about this, we've read all the different studies. One of the things that we found too in, in the body cam um, trial that we did last fall is it changed the citizens behavior quite a bit. We went to some uh, situations and immediately when they knew that they were being videotaped, their demeanor came down 50%, which helps us greatly. So that was a benefit. I never, I'll be honest, I didn't even thought about that. So, you know, some officers that may, maybe or maybe not change their behavior, that hasn't been proven overwhelmingly. But one thing we do know is that when people are being videotaped and, and audio, their behavior has changed quite a bit, which helps us in, in the turn of what happens from there. So that is a, a very big positive. Um, the costs, the initial costs of the actual cameras and the equipment to go in it, we've sent those, uh, we've sent those uh, figures off. That is minimal, if you ask me, compared to, and Carrie's gonna speak to that, is the personnel, the ongoing personnel issues of the 
public disclosure requests and the evidence, and I'm sure Tony's shop is going to speak about that, is that's where the, the real big cost in this. Uh, the initial cost and the ongoing cost is anywhere from about 300 to 350,000 for the cameras, for the setup in the cars, and for the for the uh, contracts, ongoing contracts. But the personnel issue is really where, where this is at. So I'm gonna, I'll be open to some questions now or later about the body cam system, but I wanna turn it over to Carrie about her shop, about what the actual personnel costs would be. Good Thank morning. You. Sorry, John, did no, to go ahead. cut you off there. Um, I realized that the ongoing costs are probably the biggest hit. We're looking at a total, a request of a total of five positions. That's three public disclosure, uh, one for data management, uh, and another for equipment and program management. Because as much as we'd like to think that this is just, well, you just press the button and turn it on and everybody gets to go on their way. Obviously, nothing's that easy. So at this point, we're asking for five positions. Um, if this were to be approved and we were provided, say, six months worth of uh, benefits and pay, we think about 200,000 at this point, but that's an approximation, obviously. So. Uh, Phil, did you have any, do you want to add? No, I'm not saying a question. <clears throat> any questions at this point? You're saying, I'm sorry, uh, you're saying that it's 200,000 for six months. Is that what you said? Uh, yes. That's an approximation, but that would be at the very beginning. And I will tell okay. you that the very beginning, we're not even quite sure we would be able to get people hired within six months. Okay. So we felt at this time, you know, I, I guess I would feel comfortable saying it's probably between four and 500,000 would be the ongoing for those positions. And these positions are going to be a little higher um, have a higher technical ability um, than most. So I believe the pay will probably be a little more. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Councilor. Thank you. So um, I, I'm just looking at your uh, staff report here. Um, and I see the date of July 1st, 2021. Um, that seems pretty aggressive. Um, can you talk to, to that particular day? If, if we just talked about how we may or may not be able to get folks hired in six months, um, but we have a July 20 or July 1st, 2021 potential start date. Well, what I would think is that that would be the day where we would believe funding would start to be available. I think the rollout of this program would, we're probably looking at eight to 12 months. So the city of Vancouver has been provided a year to get the program theirs up and going. So, like I said, with the hiring process, um, you know, we're looking at that's our that was our start date of when some funding would be available for us to start then pursuing putting the program together. Okay, thank you. And actually, that leads me to one more question on what. Um, coordination or communications have we been having with the city of Vancouver since they're a little bit ahead of us on this um, process? I wouldn't say that they're ahead of us because I've been I've been working with them for the last year. They they went a little different route and they decided they couldn't decide on which system. And I'm sorry. Oh, and, and they they were authorized, I think, two and a half to three million about a year ago. And then um, so they've still been working on it. We've kind of been doing all this legwork, waiting for the funding to come through to see if it, if it would be available. So that's kind of what we're waiting on. We've test driven the cars, so to speak. We're ready to buy a car, but we don't have that funding available. And the rollout, let me go back to that a little bit because Councilor Lentz and I were speaking about this a, a week or two ago. Even the body cam companies, we can't roll this all out at once, even if you had all the personnel because there's issues that go along with it and there's training. So it would be anywhere from a, a third and a third and a third. Let's say there's 150 units that we need. We can't put out 150 units by the end of this year. It just won't work that way. But we would like to get, you know, 
50 started this summer or towards the end of summer and then another 50 and then another 50. So there is a rollout plan. We can't do it all at once. Councilor Olson, this is the sheriff speaking. Uh, just to add a little bit to that, we did have initial conversations with the city hoping that we could come to a res some uh, agreement as to uh, all of us using the same equipment. And we wanted to work with them in, a, in, in testing out and, and doing all these things. And it became apparent fairly quick that they put together uh, a group, a work group and the task force in the community. And they went off in their own direction, which certainly is their right. But on top of that, what I would say is that that started us as well in looking at what uh, resources are out there for us to include other small agencies in the county. Because I do believe a big piece of this is going to be everybody in Clark County utilizing body cameras. And the smaller cities may not be able to afford that. But I think there's some creative ways that we can roll them in with us if the city doesn't want to do it so that when we mutual aid, we're in their jurisdiction, they're in ours, everybody's got a camera, we're working under the same policies and uh, certainly find a way to offset that cost, be similar to our CRESA cost where we provide radios to small agencies, but we get paid back. So that's a further discussion, but it's one that I think you should have heavy on your mind about what the rest of Clark County law enforcement looks like. Thank you, Sheriff. That uh, yeah, that that makes sense. Thanks, Madam Chair. Councilor Barrow, how did you come up with the uh, suggestion for three people to handle open records? Mm, okay, so for every minute of video needs to be redacted and reviewed, it on average takes 10 minutes. So, it, which can even be longer if someone is still in that training period or learning how to do it, learning the software. So, we take those, uh, you know, a minute and you need 10 minutes to do the redaction. So, say an average duration of video that you're reviewing is 45 minutes. So then that would be 450 minutes to uh, review that entire 45 minutes. Now from there, um, you know you have that long plus building a uh, exemption log. So that's how we took averages. It's based on the Seattle model, isn't it? Yes, averages kind of looked at what Seattle does. They have done tens of thousands of hours uh, and did a great study on how long it takes them. So really we're going, you know, looking what other jurisdictions are doing. So. And this is assuming about how many open records requests are coming to you where, the, where this source would be needed on the, on the body cams. Uh, that is correct. No, about yes. how many, I'm sorry, about how many oh. uh, cases would oh. uh, open records requests would be coming to you? That did, uh, this is sheriff again. That is a total unknown. However, um, our state is very liberal in their abilities for people to ask for. And it is widely known that when this is implemented, anybody could just ask for a year's worth of 24 seven, every officer we have their body camera and we would have to provide that for them. We do, we have over the years received anywhere from four to 600 public records requests a month at the sheriff's office, which is nothing like any other area um, receives. And so that is a total unknown. This could, we could be shocked and have people not want as much as we suspect they might. But the reality is I think we're gonna be bombarded with everybody and their brother wanting every piece of our data. And so it's going to, it's going to be, it, this is going to play out and we're going to have to revisit it as we, as we implement this throughout the, uh, the years to come. And that four to 600 that you currently have is a, is a start point only because this may generate even more such requests. That's correct. Yes. Very much so. Yes. 
And we did have some when we did our test phase for 60 days, we did get some requests and we already had to work on some redaction. Mm -hmm. Yes, they didn't. Nobody even knew that we were testing it and we actually had requests. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question that and I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but it just occurs to me. What kind of things do you redact from video? Oh, oh good. Okay. Uh, juveniles. Yes. Uh, personal oh, okay. Yeah, there's um, people that are not involved in the case, and you have to go through each one, read the case report, look at their face, license plates. So there's a lot, a lot more involved. And redaction software, it's not great, but it is helpful. So we might say, oh, that's a juvenile face, so we want to take all the faces out of here. So it can redact a, a basketball, a rock, a crock pot. We've had that happen. So then you have to go back and you have to unredact those for each frame. So it's just really detailed and time intensive. So. So they are, that sounds to me, although I, I could be misunderstanding it. Sounds to me then that you're dealing with original videos and you can't make a copy. Um, yeah, I don't understand it. Well, so we have a video and then when and I'm sure uh, the PA is going to speak to this. We have to give him an original yes. video of them and then they have to do their own work for evidence and redaction on that side too. So that's a part that he's probably going to speak to here. So we have to do our own redaction for the public disclosure right. request, but we do keep an original to send to the PA's office. Am I correct? That is correct. Yeah. Well, I guess my question is, I'm sorry. I guess my question is, um, when you get a public records request, you go, you take the video and you carefully go through it to redact certain things. And then you just said that you go back and unredact those things. I'm asking, don't you make a copy of this video for the person that had the request and redact it and still have the intact original video? Absolutely. We keep the intact video. We have to. Um, and as Chief Forch was saying, Tony's office is going to need that. We're going to need that for evidence on our side as well. So what we're doing is we're taking that video and yes, we're creating a copy of that then to work off of. So why do you need to unredact it then at the end? I think the confusion here is that the redaction equipment sometimes redacts things that aren't that it wasn't supposed to yes. it mistakes the face a football for the face or a basketball so we have to check it that's the part that they were talking about correcting okay all right thank you uh madam chair can i ask a question Councilor. um first of all thanks sheriff I, I i suddenly figured out what that was too and i was like oh that's the misunderstanding um uh, <laughs> sorry the, I, for the uh, confusion <laughs> Especially when we when we can't meet in person, it's hard because sometimes things just get lost across the internet. Um, uh, I appreciated uh, Chief Hortz you mentioning um, uh, a community group to look at and uh, give advice on policies. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about your approach to the policies regarding use, record storage, all of these things, and how how you're planning to get to final policies. Okay, so right now we're at a point we did have to come up with some initial policies. To, the main uh, people involved were, were us, obviously, the PA's office, civil PA's office, and the deputy sheriff's guild because the deputy sheriffs now have video on them. So we had to work something out. We did get a, a, a I, I believe I sent you a sample policy what we did. We've taken several policies from body cam programs around there. We're kind of combining them. We're going to sit down with the community groups, have reached out to them. They are in support of sitting down with us. And discussing this and being and sorry and being involved in this. So we're kind of at that point where I don't want to take another step and, and actually sit down at the table. But everyone's ready to sit at the table and go, let's get going on this, but it doesn't do much good unless we know that there's funding for it. So we're kind of at that point. We all are uh, ready to go. we I've reviewed some sample policies. I like some of the ones from California, but it's a matter of uh, 
matching them up to us and, and sitting down with the community groups and hearing what their concerns are before we before we put it in uh, set in stone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, may I, I chime in? Councilor Madpaji. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, great discussion. We've covered a lot of points that we had covered uh, from the very beginning in law and justice. I just want to summarize some of them and then on one area, which gets to the funding issue. So, we were hopeful uh, to have some efficiency in the process and have all the chiefs including Vancouver, uh, kind of follow the lead uh, of, of law enforcement in general, and the sheriff in particular here in the county. And that, that quickly fell apart as too hard to do, especially um, with Vancouver going its own way. And the individual chiefs um, being really uh, fearful of the budget impacts. Uh, you know, I, I've been part of this a uh, discussion for decades uh, and mainly in California and now up here. And I think over that period of time, law enforcement universally has come to accept that this is a good thing. It helps protect them. There's good behavior on both sides of the camera. Uh, there's just a lot of good impacts. You know, in the very beginning, uh, I think generally law enforcement was pretty reluctant, um, but, but that's changed uh, across the nation. Uh, and so there's no one that I know of in, in Clark County's law enforcement community from the guilds to, to the leadership um, that opposes this. And, you know, we're still getting emails, please support this. I think, and I can't speak for all the other counselors, but I want to tell you, I fully support this. You know, I've seen uh, the value uh, in both body and dash cams in law enforcement and investigative tools. And I know Tony Golick would share this. You know, it is a soda straw. It doesn't, it isn't a panacea. It is just another piece of evidence, uh, but it's, but it's very helpful. So I think for the public to know, we all support this. It is a good thing. It will add to trust. It just has a lot of benefits uh, across the law enforcement community and the justice community. Now, so where are we stuck? Washington State, and, and although the legislature spent some time uh, fairly recently trying to create exemptions for the legislature itself from the very onerous Public Records Act, uh, when the sheriff said that it's a pretty liberal state law, that's a dramatic understatement. Uh, and so that creates the burden. You know, there was some political capital spent a couple of years ago working on the privacy issues. You know, you have a rape victim of some kind, sexual assault, innocent bystanders, you name it. Uh, there are a lot of privacy issues involved in and body cameras. The legislature did dealt with that. What they didn't deal with is what we're seeing as the main stumbling block right now. Three to five employees is a huge overhead. I mean, I'd rather see more deputies on the street. You know, so what the legislature, what Congress has not dealt with is, are these funding issues uh, and the dramatic impact of public records. We, you know, as right now, we have basically people that make Public Records Act requests universally every week for great periods of time, for great amounts of information. It, it is a, a time wound. Uh, it is a cost wound. Uh, there are legitimate uses in lawsuits. You have discovery processes, journal, legitimate journalism may want to focus on an issue and make public records uh, act requests. But across the state, uh, every agency is absolutely hamstrung in that, and they're behind. I mean, there's huge weights in many of the communities right now, and that's not even looking at the body cam issue uh, for these Public Records Act requests because they are absolutely abused. And the cost is absorbed by the taxpayer, not by the person abusing the system, making these blanket requests regularly for all information that they really have no valid purpose for. So that's the real elephant in the room. The legislature needs to deal with that issue. 
Um, you know, I, as a young lawyer, I dealt with this issue on a federal level from Freedom of Information Act requests, and we had a pretty wide uh, ranging exception uh, for law enforcement. Uh, that pretty much ended the conversation and protected uh, uh, these processes. We don't have that in Washington state. We have just the opposite. So, you know, until the legislature deals with this, every law enforcement agency in the state is reluctant to do this because the county councils and and counselors uh, have to find a sustainable budget uh, to pay for this huge overhead that has no valid public purpose. It's so that that's the problem here. I mean, I, we all support this, but okay. five employees uh, to support yeah. public records act. That's the legislative yeah. challenge yeah. Uh, that should be addressed. Okay. Thank you, Gary. I, I do appreciate your input. We need to move on to other stakeholders because we need to uh, be able to finish this. This is not a decision making day. And uh, I agree with uh, what you've said, uh, Council Member G, but we need to move on. So let's move on to our next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So next, um, one of our key stakeholders is the prosecuting attorney, Tony Golick. So I would like to ask him at this time to share any impacts of body cameras with regards to operations or financial for the council's information. Thanks, Kathleen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I, I want to thank you for uh, holding this work session. It's a very important topic that uh, it's good that uh, you're looking at it now to uh, get the uh, groundwork uh, laid timely. I want to thank the sheriff's office for their forward thinking on this uh, topic. I completely agree with uh, uh, everything that uh, uh, Sheriff Atkins and his command staff said, and uh, also want to echo Councilor Medvedge's comments about uh, leadership and law enforcement. Uh, and the prosecutor's office uh, countywide being absolutely in support. Also want to highlight the fact that um, uh, all of these public records issues uh, are going to be coming uh, regardless because uh, Vancouver Police Department is going to uh, implement a body cam uh, program as they should. And it looks like it will go into effect in, in the spring of 2020. Uh, those cases, those records will come to the prosecutor's office and, uh, you know, will come into the county. Uh, so that piece is coming. Uh, so I, I want to take a minute first to just talk kind of in broad strokes about um, where these where these videos, where these records will go and, and just kind of the process for a minute. So uh, on on every case, there will be body cam footage evidence, whether it comes from the sheriff's office uh, or Vancouver Police Department or other smaller agencies as they adopt body cam uh, programs also. So uh, the prosecutor's office, if we look at felony cases, uh, for example, uh, we file roughly 2,500 felony cases per year in a, a normal pre-pandemic year and expect in 2022 we'll uh, 2021, 2022, we'll be back into those type of normal numbers. So in every case, there will be body cam footage. So the body cam footage uh, is collected by the agency. Let's, let's say this, the sheriff's department. It's collected by the sheriff's department. Uh, and then on the relevant case, uh, it's transmitted to the prosecutor's office. So the prosecutor's office, when we receive that evidence, uh, we will we'll receive it and then have the same duties uh, with that evidence that we have on all other evidence, like just like a police report, for example. So the prosecutor's office will have to get it and then send it to the defense uh, unredacted. Uh, so we don't do any redactions, generally speaking, when we're sending it to the defense, the defense uh, will need to get it all. So there's uh, that initial you know, thing that has to be done. Uh, and the really good analogy is just a police report at that point. Uh, law enforcement generates a police report on every case. The police report has to go to the prosecutor's office on every case. And then the prosecutor's office has to transmit it to the defense on every case. Uh, so that piece uh, would be very similar. Um, for every case, uh, the prosecutor assigned to the case, the deputy prosecutor will need to review 
the body cam footage, just like they need to read the police report on every case. So you have a lot of extra lawyer work. It's good that you have the extra lawyer work because like Councilor Medvedge was saying, it's good evidence. It's, it's you know, a lot, of, a lot of cases, it'll be critical evidence to establish what actually happened in the case. Uh, so, but prosecutors will have to look at this evidence and there's really no way to do that other than just sit and view the video. Now, in some cases, it'll just take a couple minutes because it'd be very little video. It's not really that relevant. There's not a lot to look at. On other cases, there'll be a lot. Uh, you know, there'll be some cases where there's, you know, a long, drawn out scene, lots and lots of officers there, lots happening, lots of video to look at. It'll just kind of really depend uh, on the individual case. Um, so, like I was saying, then the prosecutor's office will have to send it to the defense, just like on every, uh, you know, all other evidence. And then indigent defense will have that same. Burden. This is going to be a significant increase for indigent defense because the defense attorney, they're going to have to look at that video also. Uh, defense attorneys use defense investigators. Uh, they will, you know, make decisions on, you know, whether the defense investigator uh, does all of the looking at the video. Uh, a lot of times, the uh, the actual defense attorney will want to look at all the video. It'll depend case by case, but there'll be a very significant. Uh, impact to indigent defense because it's just a lot more information. It would be, uh, I think a good analogy would be just if every officer wrote a whole ton more uh, in their reports, it's just a lot more to look at on every case. So there'd be a very significant impact to indigent defense. And I think that uh, that has not been uh, identified maybe uh, as much as it should, but that that's significant. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the first uh, layer of you know, what's going to happen with these body cam videos. Now, uh, and I'll talk about public record records in a minute, but this is just the kind of the normal criminal process for what will happen with these videos. Now, there won't be much uh, impact to the clerk's office or the court. Uh, so when the Prosecutor's office gets the videos. Like I say, we send them to the defense. The defense looks at them. They work up. They work them, and both sides work the case. Um, they won't go to the clerk's office. The only reason that it would go to the clerk, clerk's office generally at all that I could see would be if the case goes to trial. Very small percentage of those twenty five hundred cases actually goes to trial. It's less than five percent, uh, and. Uh, uh, a body cam video would just be a trial exhibit, just like a photograph. Uh, so, you know, the clerk's office would have to admit it in uh, into evidence. But like I say, it would be just like any other piece of evidence. So I don't see a big impact to the clerk's office, <clears throat> nor to the court. Uh, these videos would not be filed with the court generally. Uh, they have, there will be some additional pretrial uh, discovery uh, disputes, perhaps, or uh, evidentiary argument with respect to body cams, videos. I don't know that it would really increase the level of litigation. It may it possibly could slightly decrease it. Uh, I don't. I don't see a big impact because there's body cams uh, to the uh, to the courts. And again, they're not going to be just regularly sent over to the court's office. The court doesn't receive these like the prosecutor's office in indigent defense. There may be some additional uh, work for the courts, but not, they're not gonna be directly largely impacted like the sheriff's office, prosecutor's office in indigent defense. Um, so that's kind of the, the general, what will happen with these body cam uh, videos. Now, the other big part is the public records part. The sheriff's office uh, covered the public records part on their end. So when the record um, request is made to the sheriff's office, and my expectation is that's where the vast majority uh, of the requests will go, uh, will be the sheriff's office. Uh, but they will come to the prosecutor's office also, because once we receive uh, the video, just like once we receive a police report, then the prosecutor's office has that record. Uh, so if uh, an individual or um, the media or whoever makes a public records request to the prosecutor's office, we'll have to do that same 
public records processing like the sheriff's office was talking about. I don't see the public records part impacting the courts or the uh, the clerk's office uh, or indigent defense. Uh, so I see the public records part uh, impacting the sheriff's office to the greatest degree uh, and then the prosecutor's office secondarily um, for the same reasons. So that those are the, the kind of the, the broad brush uh, explanations that I wanted to give uh, about how I see uh, the body cams affecting uh, the workload in the system. So we, we put together uh, for the prosecutor's office side kind of our best estimate of uh, what we think we will need staffing wise to handle this new workload uh, with body cams. <clears throat> you know, I want to again stress I am extremely in support of body cams. You know, th this is something that we need to do. Uh, you know, we would have done it long ago if it wasn't expensive. I've always said, you know, it's expensive. Uh, you know, new things like this are expensive, uh, but we, you know, have reached a point in our community uh, and in our state where we need to, uh, you know, wrap our arms around this and say, this is what we need to do uh, and move forward. So uh, the, uh, the document that uh, is up that you're looking at, uh, like I say, is it, it's a kind of our best guess at this point uh, for where we would be um, in 2022 when uh, sheriff's office, VPD, everybody's up and running with body cams. Uh, we'll, we'll need extra de deputy prosecutor positions uh, for the uh, reason that I explained that you're going to it's going to be looking at a lot of additional deputy prosecutor work because they're going to have to. They're going to have to sit and look at every one of these videos on cases. Uh, that's just something they're going to have to do. Uh, similar uh, issues on the indigent defense side. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, requesting a, uh, a a department information systems coordinator, uh, an OA2, and then one additional public record specialist. Uh, that's again our best guess on the public record side. Sheriff's office is requesting three. Uh, we I'm confident we'll get less public records work on the prosecutor's office side, but it will be uh, significant. I would indicate that um, these costs should be uh, phased in over sort of a period of time, and these are the kind of the overall costs I see uh, when this is fully implemented. Uh, I like the uh, uh, the fact that the sheriff's office is looking at doing a phased approach with uh, something like 50 body cams later this summer. That will give us, I think, a, a much better uh, idea uh, of uh, you know what we're going to be looking at for the public records part uh, and the workload. Uh, so my intent is to uh, do a decision package for our 2022 budget uh, with uh, you know much more. Information uh, and a, 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 a firmer uh, idea of the costs. Uh, I would indicate that uh, the the one position that I think will be critical to fund quickly will be that department information systems coordinator position, the disc position, uh, because that's the position that will uh, be able to liaise with the sheriff's office and VPD uh, for the implementation of. Uh, the systems of the body cam. So that's a position that we'll need quickly. Uh, the rest uh, we will be able to phase in. Those are my general comments. I know I said a lot fast, but uh, I'm available for questions now. Uh, initial question for the council. So, Tony. Uh, are, is the total cost then you're looking at uh, 573 356 in 2022 and 23 is 543 816. Correct. And like I say, those those are uh, you know our best estimates uh, at at this point for those uh, those positions. The uh, we're looking at all position uh, all of this as staff positions other than just the data data storage uh, piece. Um, 
that uh, we'll obviously need for all this additional uh, data and then so, you know a little bit of uh, setup for you know uh, office spaces that sort of thing so that that's the that's the reason for the decrease the following year but but that is ongoing then perfect right. into perpetuity yep Other questions or clarification of the council? Madam Chair. Uh, hey, Tony, thank, thanks for the all the information and, and um, data that you provided. I appreciate it. I, I'm just, and maybe the sheriff is still on the line. I'm trying to get a sense of since a big cost that we're looking at going forward is staffing, um, obviously. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, maybe average length of these videos. I was kind of crunching some numbers here on what you gave us and um, with 250 officers producing 2 million videos in three years based on some studies, um, that, that's a lot of video. That's like uh, 2,600 per day or 98 per day um, per officer on an eight hour shift. Um, that's a lot of video. So I'm just wondering where you got that number and is that really like, High end, low end, um, and I know it's difficult to predict, um, but that's driving the staffing number. Is kind of how how many videos we have to look at, how long they are, how complicated they are. And I know it's um, I know it's not easy to predict, but I'm just curious about those numbers. Councilor, is this a question for me or the sheriff? Yeah, yeah, for you to start with. Okay, okay. Um, so the. Um, so you, you have all of the officers and all you know all the video going. The the, uh, the driver is going to be, you know, when there's a case and then there's a video attached to the case. So there'll be a lot of time where you know officers are out there and they're creating video, but it, it there's no case attached to it. They haven't made an arrest. They haven't had an interaction. Um, so the, uh, the the pieces uh, that we're looking at uh, for additional uh, funding staff. So we've got a program assistant, uh, that uh, department information system coordinator, uh, and an OA2. Those are the ones that are just kind of handling the, di the discovery part, the, the getting, it's, it's like I say, it's very similar to us getting police reports from the sheriff's office. You know, it, a lot of these systems exist. You know, we have a lot of data that already we get from law enforcement every day, massive amounts of data. Data, you know, from every law enforcement agency countywide. Every time they, you know, make an arrest, uh, or a lot of times even if they don't, uh, you know, they collect evidence, they write reports. Uh, all of that uh, data comes to us, uh, and then we have to kick it over to the defense, and then our lawyers have to look at it, assess it make pretrial offers. So this is just another whole big chunk of that same sort of data. You know, the, the, the best analogy uh, or an analogy, uh, a lot of times we actually, we already have video from lots and lots of cases because there is a door cam video or uh, a business that's got, got a video, maybe a security video. It would be like having a good, you know, a good security video on every case instead of a lot of cases or another one because it's a dash cam uh, on top. So, like I said in the beginning, sometimes our DPAs will need to spend a lot of time looking at a whole bunch of video to prep for a trial. Uh, uh, in other cases, they just won't have to look at that much uh, because it's not that, that complex. Just like. Um, you know, looking at the complexity of cases in general. Sometimes it's a simple case. There's not very many police reports. Doesn't take much time for a DPA to look at the case, make an offer. The defense looks at it, uh, and uh, the case pleads. Other times, uh, there's a lot. So, you know, that that's that's why that um, I say that that request that I'm going to make for our um, our 2022 budget. It's hard to predict. I'm looking forward to getting information uh, when the sheriff's office starts to implement to see really how significant the impact to our deputy prosecutors is. I may end up asking for more than three deputy prosecutor positions. I may ask for less than three. I think that's going to be about right based on uh, kind of what we've been able to glean so far. 
Hmm. And part of the request is one public records person. Right. Yeah. And and I ex I expect that it will require at least one public records person because there's just going to be uh, all of the same things that the sheriff's office said with respect to redaction. You know, we'll have these records also. We'll get less of the request just because, uh, like Chuck was saying, they get all of the requests all the time for police reports. We get them too, but just less. So I, I, I think, you know, one uh, is, uh, is a conservative request to start up. We may, we may end up needing more moving forward. We're just going to have to assess as we go. How many public records folks do you have currently? Uh, so we, we have one person that just uh, does that uh, full time. Uh, we have uh, two attorneys that uh, that spend a significant part of their time uh, doing support on public records and then another uh, individual that does it about half of their time. Okay. Hey, uh, are there other questions of the council for vacation? I'm done. Thank you. Uh, I did have a question. Actually, Councilor Olson asked the question about the length of the videos because that comes into play. Do you have a jurisdiction that you've used as an example of the length that is similar to our jurisdiction? Not a good one yet. I'm working on that. And the other question I had was you said that this should be phased in over time. My question, and I hope somebody will, there's a lot of feedback, at least on my end when I'm speaking. So if people can mute while I'm speaking, it might be helpful. Um, uh, the uh, idea of phasing this in over time, and for instance, the sheriff's office doing 50 uh, cameras. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do we pay for that? Not the cameras, but the cost of a pilot project to even see where we are. I'm not sure how we're going to even pay for that. So do you have ideas of how we can do that? I, I understand, uh, you know, we're the ones that um, okay the budget, but even a pilot project and to show us what we are going to need in the future uh, is will be costly to us. Any ideas? This is a question for me, Chair. Anybody who could answer that. Tony, um, are you going to go first? Right, John, you go ahead and then I'll follow on. <clears throat> okay, maybe uh, maybe I'll clarify a little bit. When I, when I said 50, I was talking about the roll-up plan. I don't think we're looking at this as a pilot project per se. We, we want to be all in, but the rollout, uh, for lack of a better way, you could call it a startup project and then see where we are from there. And that's what the body cam companies do. We there are some unknowns. Councilor Olson said it. We don't know. Could be a little less. Could be a lot more. We just don't know. And we can't. We don't just want to start out with 150. So the initial cost would be less. Uh, personnel, you need them in place. That's the main thing uh, before we do these. So if I kind of misspoke and made it sound like we were a pilot project, we had already tested them last, I believe, September and October of last year. But it's not a. We're not looking at it as a pilot. Okay, okay, understood. That's uh, good to know, even though we will, as this rolls out, we will know better uh, in the future if we roll it out. Okay, um, Chair, there is a sheriff. Uh, real quick, I want to say that with the 50 rollout, it's important for us to then stabilize and make sure that we have everything that we need in place, the bodies and the policy. And then from there, that rollout will be as quick as efficiently possible to get everybody outfitted so that we don't have a situation where we have an officer not have a body camera when somebody else does, or we should have been involved in one. So it'll be as quick a rollout as we can officially do. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions of uh, Mr. Golick before we move to our next? Uh, presenter. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we'll we'll move on now uh, to. Is it the court? 
Yes, yeah, Superior Court, Jessica Gurley, the Superior Court Administrator is on. I don't believe the presiding judge is on, so I can hand it over to Jessica. Good morning, counselors and Madam uh, County Manager. Um, I've had discussions with uh, Judge Collier, and the Superior Court believes that any additional information that can be provided during trials as evidence uh, is useful for our decision making. In terms of impact, uh, you know, fiscally, we echo Mr. Uh, Gullick's uh, comments. Thank you, Tony. There is no significant impact uh, perceived by the Superior Court. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, next will be District Court. Amber Emery is the District Court Administrator. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, we echo what Jessica said and also Mr. Golick's comments about impact to the courts. The only thing I will mention as far as maybe a 2022 look for us is making sure our audio visual, visual equipment in the courts is up to speed to be able to handle what comes to trial and also our recording equipment. Just to, We've done some upgrades due to COVID over the last uh, year, but I just want to make sure and just put that out there that that could be a potential thing that we could look at down the road for both courts um, with that. But as far as staff impact or immediate fiscal impact, we do not have that. Okay, thank you so much. Next. Juvenile would be juvenile would be next, but I don't believe the administrator is on for juvenile. So I'll move forward to the clerk's office and we do have Scott Weber and Bain. So Scott. Uh, good morning. Um, I, I think Tony's correct. Uh, I don't. I don't see an impact to the clerk's office uh, other than uh, getting phone calls and tying into that process to make sure that that public records request goes to the correct location. So that's what the clerk's office has to report. Thank you. We have someone uh, then from Indigent Defense. <laughs> um, and uh, we first, um, and I don't know if the sheriff has any additional information regarding the, any IT feedback. So I would ask that first. And then once they conclude, we do have our IT director on as well um, if he has any feedback. So, Sheriff, do you have any additional information regarding information technology? Uh, yes, that is rolled into Chief Shelton's shop. Um, so she oversees the IT portion. So she's including that in her package deal. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Sprinkle, um, our IT director for the county. Do you have any feedback for the council? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, first of all, thanks for allowing me to be a part of this and want to make sure that everyone understands that uh, Clark County IT is very in support of this initiative and helping out getting it rolled out and having a successful project. Um, there's a couple things that um, I wanted to mention around uh, hardware and storage. There's an unknown on the PDR requests from our perspective about how much of the video would um, end up back at the county. So I know that the sheriff's office has looked at using cloud services um, for the vendors where the videos would be uh, uploaded to. Uh, some of those videos would, I would assume, would come back to the county infrastructure uh, when they're shared with the PA's office or indigent defense or potentially as part of the PDR request. So we could have, uh, although we'd be paying for storage with the body cam vendor, we may have additional storage needs at the county as well. Um, that could easily be a $150,000 to $250,000 uh, increase yearly on storage needs, depending on the volume of uh, the videos uh, that we're looking at. Additionally, uh, as those videos are being uploaded and downloaded, there could be an impact to the county's internet bandwidth. We can easily take care of that by increasing our bandwidth, but that also would be about a $30,000 to $50,000 a year increased budget need uh, to handle that. Um, and then lastly, 
Um, we're, we're not entirely sure what the, um, since we haven't picked a vendor yet, we haven't had a, a great chance to pick their brains about the impact to uh, IT staffing needs. Um, our current uh, staff is booked out in projects basically going out to the beginning of 2022, which means if there was additional resources needed from IT to help implement the body cam project, we would have to look at either contract resources or uh, short term project term employees. And so some additional budget would be needed there. It's a little difficult for me to say exactly how many we would need and who we would need until we could have a chance to chat with uh, a potential vendor to see how uh, IT might be impacted. Um, so again, we're fully in support and ready to help in any way we can. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Is there any clarifying questions for Mike before I go on to the next stakeholder from the council? Okay, so the next um, stakeholder is Indigent Defense. We have both staff and a couple of Indigent Defense attorneys um, with us today. So I would start with Lindsay Schaefer, um, who's the manager over Indigent Defense to um, discuss any anything from the county staff perspective and then I'll ask the attorney. So Lindsay. Good morning, Council. So, um, as Tony Gullick, you know, appropriately mentioned, I think that many of the impacts to, um, you know, the, the county, there's going to be some similarities between engine defense and the prosecutor's office um, in terms of the fact that it takes, um, you know, it takes a human being watching in real life time to watch these things. And, um, you know, so somebody's going to have to watch every minute of the footage and that takes time. Um, Clark County is, as you know, um, a bit of an anomaly in how large of a jurisdiction we are and yet we utilize the contractor model for engine defense. And so comparing us to other similar sized jurisdictions that have implemented a body cam program, it's difficult to estimate with any degree of precision the anticipated costs because most of the other jurisdictions our size have added staff within their internal office of public defender. And so in terms of costs that we would see implementing this, um, and I will echo the comments that have been said that I think um, the indigent defense community is excited about the you know rollout of body cams within our sheriff's office, um, but there's certainly some cost increase that would you know take place. So, um, one on the, the IT side of it, so there's the question of, are we going to have anything that's compatible with all of the different types of computers that our contractors use? So we don't have a system um, where we have some universal countywide because, of course, we utilize the contractors and they purchase their own computers, their own devices. Um, so we would need to make sure that whatever we use is something that no matter what kind of system that our contractors have would be capable of working with that. Um, a second question that uh, our contractors have raised is what kind of cloud storage are we going to have? These are these are large files. Um, and so would it be possible to have some sort of um, you know, cloud storage within the county that then we would authorize our contractors through some sort of secure login to be able to view the footage within the county. Now, that may be less expensive than, um, you know, however we would compensate attorneys for the fact that they would need additional storage for all of the, the videos that they would have. Um, so, there's some IT questions that would need to be worked out and until we work those out, we don't really know exactly what those costs would be. Um, the other question in terms of costs is, you know, as the prosecutor's office mentioned, their proposal to deal with the increase of workload is an increase in staff. Um, we don't have the same corollary on the engine defense side because we wouldn't be increasing the internal county staff. So the question for the council then becomes, how do we appropriately address this at the engine defense level? And, um, you know, I think one option is looking at, okay, if there's increased time to handle a case, is there an increase in compensation for the increase in time? Is there an increase in the number of contracts that we award? No matter how you slice and dice it, there's going to be an increase in expense. Um, and without really being able to address the, the computer, the one time, costs there, I would expect our costs to be similar um, in terms of ongoing expenses that the prosecutor's office would have. 
um, you know, because in reality, it's it's the same amount of work, uh, if not more, because, you know, we still have to have the defense investigators reviewing the video. We have to have the defense attorneys reviewing the video. So I also agree with with Tony in saying that if the sheriff's office implements a phased approach for this and um, we're able to see, OK, how is this implemented? We can start answering some of those IT questions, figuring out how much time these things take. We'll have a much better idea of of what that would look like at a full, um, fully you know, developed body cam program, what our costs would be. So that being said, um, I'm happy to turn it over to, we have two attorneys here um, that can speak to any of the other questions that you may have in terms of how this would be implemented. But I think it may be helpful to, to turn it to the council, see what questions you have, and then figure out amongst the, the folks we have here who would be best to answer those questions. I would also ask um, the attorneys that are on, Sean Downs, is there any additional information that you would like to share regarding operational or financial impacts that maybe Lindsay hasn't covered? Sure, thanks. So um, I think in terms of how much work an indigent defense contractor or an indigent defense attorney uh, has to deal with here is um, going to be at least an hour more work for simple cases, and then it's going to be 10 or more hours for more complex cases. Uh, from my personal experience dealing with Washington State Patrol dash cams, there's usually going to be uh, at least 60 minutes of of that video. And then uh, when you're reviewing it, obviously you're rewinding it, making sure you can hear what's going on and uh, might have an investigator review it as well and then go through the applicable portions with your client. So um, for a 60 minute video, there's gonna be over an hour of, of work involved with that. I would say that um, it's going to be, I would say 10% more time uh, spent uh, reviewing these videos. I have an associate attorney who worked in Lane County, Oregon, um, and the Eugene Police Department had body cams there, Springfield, Police Department did not. Uh, his uh, experience over four years working there is that it, it is going to be uh, hours more time reviewing uh, these videos, uh, but it is it is worthwhile. Uh, it, you can tell the difference between Eugene Police Department and Springfield Police Department, how they interact with individuals that they contact, and um, also it's easier when dealing with your clients. Uh, might reduce the amount of litigation based on. Uh, what they uh, say happened and what the video indicates happened. So it, it's a net positive. It's it's something we absolutely support. It's just it will take much more time for contractors to review. Thank you. And Christy, do you have any um, updates that you would like to share with the council? Thank you. Um, our office holds the contract for misdemeanors with the county. So we're averaging about 2,800 misdemeanor cases a year. If we were really conservative and said that that would generate maybe an hour of footage, additional discovery to review for each of those cases, staffing wise, I would probably need at least another attorney or two um, to deal with the additional time. Um, I think as far as uh, the other contractors, I would say our number one concern, of course, is going to be digital storage. Um, something that would have the capability and that would be secure, I think, is best if it's um, coming from the county and it's something that the contractors access. Um, the second, I think the attorneys, um, it's just going to be, I would echo what Sean has said, it's just the additional time on a case. Um, not only is the attorney reviewing it, the investigator potentially, but also the reviewing it with the client. Um, and that's just going to add time to every case that we handle going forward. Uh, it's good work, necessary work, um, but it will take time. All right, thank you. Um, I ask also, I believe I have some members of the finance team that's on here. We have been continually looking at uh, funding options um, for this request. And 
Um, if there's anything that any of the finance team members want to um, share at this time to the council, uh, there'll certainly be further conversations as we move through the supplemental budget process. But if, you, if there's anything of value right now, um, I would like to ask any of them to, um, to come forward. Okay, I'm not hearing anything um, from them right now. Uh, so Chair, I can hand this back to you. Um, if the council has any other questions for any of our key stakeholders that have joined us today or any additional data or feedback that you would like um, staff to work on as we move through this process, this would be the time to um, have those conversations. Okay, um, I just, I do have a comment and just a thought to throw out there as, as a seed for thought and uh, as we move on with this discussion, because this is just the preliminary um, look at this, uh, even though I know, I know the sheriff's office prosecutors, you all that have presented have spent a lot of time on this. I'm not saying that you haven't, that this is just seed. Uh, you've spent a lot of time and I appreciate the time you put in it to, to present this. The one thing, uh, as those who have to approve the budget, um, th these are significant costs. And uh, what I'm thinking is, and we have had a few emails about, uh, you know, going ahead with this, and we do support it. I, I mean, I support the idea. It is finding the funds to do this. And we are a county that is a border county, therefore has a structural deficit because of our sales tax revenues. So I, I, I say that to um, to have you consider and think about, and maybe those who, who would know the law with regard to this, uh, can we go to the people and ask the people if they support this and would support it with an additional um, uh, with additional revenue or tax coming from them that would go specifically to support this. It, um, I would think it should it should actually be something that goes directly to this. And I don't know if if there is an avenue to do that, but uh, those are my thoughts. Um, other counselors, you have thoughts or. Madam Chair, Councillor Olson. Yeah, so uh, one, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think um, if there's an opportunity to do a public safety um, sales tax bill or something of that particular, I think it's worth exploring those options. Um, I didn't get an actual. Do we have estimate on the indigent defense? Excuse me, indigent defense costs in terms of what is that? Another half a million? Is that? Do we have a ballpark there? So on the cost, the real question there um, is because we wouldn't be adding FTEs, the real question is what what we would be doing in terms of the, the contract rates. Um, and I didn't want to make an assumption for the council in terms of what increase, if any, um, we would be doing for the contract rates. So once I have an indication from the council, kind of what the desire would be there, I will note that, you know, just from a, you know, an equity and a parity standpoint that, you know, you can anticipate at least the same, if not, you know, more um, hours and work on behalf of the ancient defense attorneys. So the ballpark provided by Tony for the cost for the prosecutor's office is probably at least with in the realm of what we would anticipate for indigent defense, but the reason that I didn't put forward an exact number is because the council would, um, in order to know what the council wants to do, we'd need to know what you want to do in terms of those contract rates. Does that answer your question, Councilor? Yes, thank you. Other questions, comments? Councilor Bauman. Uh, Lindsay, with regard to the uh, cloud storage requirements that you would have in indigent defense, is that consumed also within the IT county uh, costs there, or is yours in addition? It depends how we would do it. So, if the county were to have, for example, some sort of, and, and this is speaking beyond my expertise, and Mike, jump in. Um, but if the county were to have some some cloud storage that we would authorize our contractors to have some sort of secure access to, 
then it's possible that I, the engine defense wouldn't have any additional IT, um, you know, as long as it's compatible with all of the different formats that our contractors use, then engine defense wouldn't have any additional beyond IT's expenses. Now, on the flip side, if we would, you know, be giving this data to our contractors, you know, as Chrissy Emmerich mentioned, it's it's the cloud storage. How do we do that? And there is a cost. And so, you know, it would be, we would need to be, um, paying for that cost for our, and you know in your in defense attorneys potentially the investigators um so how we do it is going to depend on what that cost would be does mike have a comment on that <laughs> yes uh i do um so the the good news about cloud storage is that it only charges you as you use it whereas when we buy storage that is in the county infrastructure, we have to pay for the whole thing all up front, right? So it tends to be very expensive up front. Um, whereas the cloud storage, we could certainly, um, we don't have that today, but we could easily accommodate that need for indigent defense. Um, it's difficult to say exactly where the costs end up. Um, all of the cloud storage providers provide you with um, almost like a mortgage calculator you can put in how much storage you need and they try to generate for you the the cost um, it tends to be a little squishier than a mortgage calculator in terms of what the actual cost is it's part of the reason why i haven't um, quite moved any of the county data in that direction is because i don't want to surprise anyone with a bill that comes monthly that we weren't anticipating. So um, we'd have to do a little bit of research uh, to figure out if we could kind of get to what that cost looked like. Um, but again, the nice thing is it starts out small and as the the use of the videos ramps up, then the cost ramps up, but um, so you don't have that cost all up front, but it, it is difficult to say right now what that cost would be. Other question. Madam Chair. Chair. Councilor Ryan. Um, I have a question that may be more for county manager or uh, a little bit for everybody. Um, we have public records uh, employees scattered throughout departments in the county. And so we have very different responses when when requests come in uh you know based on department to department and i'm wondering about the the possibility um uh, presuming we were to move forward on this and thus have this additional public records aspect if this potentially presents an opportunity to uh consolidate and streamline a county-wide approach to public records uh, you know, PDR management and public records management that um, may or may not necessarily uh, change the dollar amounts that we're talking about, but could potentially change how we handle it and how the, the workloads are distributed throughout throughout the county. Um, it had occurred to me that, you know, we have we have public records uh, folks in, in our department and public works and uh, some of these duties can't leave the departments, but is this potentially an opportunity to create higher function by looking at a public records management process that is countywide? Thank you, Councillor. That's a great one. So I know the folks that actually do the public records full time as their job would love that and have been advocating for a centralized system for years. Um, and we are looking at doing that um, within our internal services departments and other departments because um, one, we're very unique in that we don't have a, a dedicated department, uh, whether it's under risk or under the county manager's office compared to other um, governmental jurisdictions in the state of Washington. And secondly, the folks that are doing um, the individual public records requests in some of our departments, while they're they're doing the best they can. This is not their full-time job. So they are, it is like, oh, we have one. So now we got to put our regular work away to do this. So I do think that it can, there are opportunities to increase the efficiency as well as reduce any liabilities because when it's not your dedicated work and it is very 
um, restrictive and, ve and very prescribed by law on what is redacted and what is not. And we certainly, I know that the employees today are doing the best they can, but I also know it's not their day-to-day -day job. And so um, there's concern that we're, you know, we want to make sure that we're providing the, the adequate information that's being requested. So there are definitely opportunities to have those conversations outside of just the internal services department as well. Other questions? Okay, I'm going to ask the county manager to kind of do one last thing, and that is if you could uh, look at all of these costs that we've been given about potential ongoing costs, as well as the initial cost, uh, that would be helpful before we leave this meeting. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so the initial cost um, from what I read, and of course, if any of the stakeholders, if I misspeak, please correct me, but it's about a half a million for the purchase of it. Um, there may be some initial costs uh, with IT, with the storage and bandwidth, maybe some project staff that we don't have that full cost. So that's about 800 to a million um, dollars right now. So 500,000 for the initial purchase. And then um, I would say approximately another uh, 500 to be safe, so close to 800,000 to 1 million for the initial cost. Um, the estimated that I'm hearing right now for ongoing um, could go up to almost 2 million. And I would say the ongoing, as the stakeholders had shared today, that is personnel cost. There, there definitely is some replacement cost of the system that has been incorporated in the sheriff's office estimate. Their high end right now is about 1.1 million ongoing. That does include some of the non-personnel, um, but the majority of the cost is personnel. And as we know, those costs are not static. So that just keep that in mind too, as we move forward that while that's an estimated right now, they will increase every year as um, wages and benefits may increase as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. If there just, are no, I, go ahead, what? And I just wanna clarify too that, you know, there's certainly still unknowns and that has been expressed today with uh, regards to storage and digit defense and, you know, any other project staff that need to assist it. So there is additional cost that, that most likely will incur. Okay, thank you so much. I, yeah. So, uh, once again, I, I want to thank all of you who put a lot of work into this and we, we will continue to uh, look at these, the various avenues of how, uh, what sort of uh, possible revenue we may be able to uh, find in order to implement this. So, uh, we will be continuing this discussion. But I really appreciate this initial uh, information to help us to move forward and talk about it more. So, with that, we will close this work session and the council will uh, move on to council time. I'm going to give you five minutes in between this uh, meeting and our council time meeting, and I will see you on the other side. Thank you. Thank you.